and opened Roxton College to undergraduates during the fall and spring semesters and to graduate students during the summer sessions. Students came from a wide range of American universities to participate in this unique cultural and academic experience. We always try to put a great deal of emphasis in, on art in uh, the public places around the campuses. This is a good example of the statue of Ulysses by Mestrovich, which Sally and I donated to the university. At the Tine campus, there is the beautiful mural on the library by uh, Zorak, which I think is one of the best in the United States. And at Rutherford, we created a little plaza highlighted by Carl Millis' statue, Creativity. At Teaneck, we find a sculpture by one of our own graduates, Paul Ringelheim, Paul the Wall of Peace. You remember it was displayed at the World's Fair in the United States Pavilion. I think it's important to uh, talk about the involvement of the faculty because at every point in our development, the faculty was involved. And uh, when we uh, were accredited as a uh, two-year college, immediately thereafter, the faculty met for a weekend and the decision was made by them to become a four-year institution. And during that weekend, the uh, curricula and the courses were worked out. And it was uh, a fairly Dickinson uh, professor, Dr. Anastasia, who was really responsible for the origin of our uh, St. Croix Marine Biology Laboratory. She had taken a group of students uh, our biology students on a vacation and study trip to St. Croix. Uh, Mr. Dickinson became interested in the project and he gave the university seven acres so that we could uh, erect a, a laboratory on the site. And that's how it came into being. I think the dedication at St. Croix was very interesting. The theme, as you will remember, was man returns to the sea for knowledge and abundance. Instead of a cornerstone, we placed a sculpture by Heim Gross at the bottom of the sea. If the human race were wiser, we would stop the crazy race for the moon and concentrate on the intelligent use of the sea. It is almost with a sense of impending tragedy that faces the world that I dedicate the Marine Biology Laboratory of Fairleigh Dickinson University at St. Croix, Virgin Islands, as a step towards the future, for no university worthy of its name can afford not to concern itself with man's last effort for survival. One of the projects I was proudest of was the Honors College. And here again, the faculty was involved. They approved the concept and then chose a committee to work out the curriculum and the courses. The students were chosen on the basis of intellectual equipment, personality, and motivation. Each student chose his or her own faculty mentor. And it was these mentors who made the success of the Honors College. I am glad to say that uh, all of the students involved in this program did far better work and more work than they would have done under the prescribed curriculum. Uh, well, but it wasn't all work and no play. We encouraged a great many uh, activities. Well, why don't you tell us about some of them? Well, I remember the swimming parties in the old castle. The square dances in Western costume. The visit to the Wayside Inn in Massachusetts when students in colonial costumes relived a day in the 18th century. Students took trips to the Bowery and lived for three days on only $2 for their expenses. 
We had student dinners on campus. We put on faculty shows with original scripts and organized the Women's Reserve Corps with smart uniforms. And our students took their elections seriously and yet gleefully. Our debutante cotillions held 11 years in a row at the Hotel Plaza in New York and chanted everyone, including the United Nations ambassadors who came and danced with the debutantes. Estelle Liebling gave opera vignettes for the whole college, and one of her pupils, Beverly Sills, came to sing for us and wanted to enroll at the university. But just then, she got her first break in San Francisco and had to change her plans. I do think our emphasis on lifetime sports rather than team sports was important. Swimming, hiking, golf, tennis were favorites. And I remember Professor Henry Clement taking the students on fishing trips. I remember also the first dance that was held in the old castle. And then the organization of the pipe band. It was one of the three bagpipe bands in the United States. And wasn't it thrilling when they joined the St. Patrick's Day Parade and marched up Fifth Avenue in the kilts made of the Fairleigh Dickinson tartan, the Macbeth plaid. Another group equally interesting were the Fairleigh Dickinson Knights. Their medieval costumes were designed by our friend Anna Karinska of Hollywood fame. They served as guards of honor for ceremonies held in Grace Chapel, which adjoined Rutherford campus, and at commencements. And of course, we encouraged travel abroad. And at one time, we had groups in five countries, Liberia, Thailand, Korea, Italy, and of course, in England. I think even more important was that you convinced the trustees to send the entire social science department to the critical areas of the world, in Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and the Soviet Union, so that they could bring back a knowledge of the international problems of the world into the bloodstream of the university. Yes, and then it was also natural that uh, we invited distinguished professors from foreign countries to enrich our social science curriculum. It is worth mentioning our attitude toward foreign students. We encouraged them to come to the university and we gave them special English classes. We encouraged our own students to invite them to their homes. We invited the foreign students to our own home, and I remember the dinners we used to prepare for them at the Rutherford campus. And of course, once a semester, the foreign students were introduced to the whole student body at the weekly college community conference. Today, in our travels, we often come across the foreign students. And on occasion, we will meet groups, as we did in Colombia, South America, when 10 graduates came from all over the country to visit with us in Medellin. Each one was a leader in his own field. And one of our students, whose father was the owner of the Tiger Bomb <laughs> Enterprises, prevailed upon him to have a Fairleigh Dickinson exhibit in the famous Tiger Bomb Gardens right. in Singapore. Well, to this day, we receive cards from tourists expressing their amazement that there is a bit of Fairleigh Dickinson University in Singapore. But we looked up parents, too, and I remember in Sierra Leone, when uh, we met the mother of one of our students, all week long she sold palm oil in order to send a little spending money to her daughter in Rutherford. We always thought of libraries first. And although we started with a very modest one, we now have eight general and professional libraries. We thought of classrooms, libraries, and then laboratories. I remember our first laboratory, which cost $200 to build. But curiously, it was just as effective as later laboratories costing $50,000. And we finally wound up with 43 laboratories on seven campuses. I always used to say, if we had just settled for one campus, 
we would not always be building multiples of everything. Libraries, laboratories, gymnasiums, classroom buildings, student unions, and dormitories. Sometimes our critics used to say we were only interested in buildings. But with a university that had seven campuses and a student body that grew rapidly to 20,000, building programs were inevitable. To build a university is a beautiful and exhilarating experience. But to have the opportunity to create seven new campuses is something that has never happened in the history of higher education. And what a privilege it is to see thousands of students go forth to assume their responsibilities in life. Even in retirement, this is rewarding, for as we see our former students, they recall how our lives have been entwined. But you know, Sally, if I had to do it over again, I just wouldn't have the energy. Oh, yes, you would if we could just turn back the clock. For now, we know the secret of living, and that is to create and to help others. You agree? We hope you do, Dr. San Martino, and I believe I speak for the tens of thousands of students who have attended Fairleigh Dickinson University and the 50,000 who earned their degrees there. Most of us continue to live and work in the metropolitan area. Many of us work together professionally or on community projects. It's always a pleasant surprise and an instant bond to discover that your client or neighbor also attended Fairleigh Dickinson. And after 40 years, our alumni organization is strengthening and reaching out to involve more people each year. This is all the direct result of your labors. There are many other things to thank you both for. Your philosophy that college prepares people not just for careers, but for an enriched lifestyle. Your unusual and creative ideas for turning extracurricular activities into enlightening educational experiences. Your curious minds which caused you to seek out and build a richly textured faculty with unusual life experiences to share with their students. And the warmth and love you have expressed in countless unsung ways by acts of generosity toward individual students, staff, and faculty. For all this and more, we salute you, Peter and Sally San Martino and we salute your dream.